All right. Welcome everyone to happy hour. So I am Amanda. I am one of the program coordinators here with NAMI Orange County. Um, if for those of you unfamiliar or new to us, um, Happy Hour is one of our teen and young adult programs we offer here where we take an hour to just discuss mental health, take into account our self-care and mental wellness, um, and just have an hour of happiness. Uh, so we are um, NAMI, we're part of the National Alliance on Mental Illness. And, you know, thank you guys for tuning in and joining us. Um, Jerrica will be dropping in the chat. We do have a survey. Um, this as a nonprofit is super, super important to us where it allows us to create more programs at no cost to our community um, and anything that we can do for the future. Let us know in that survey. We, we really, really appreciate it. So as we get going um, into this conversation, I do have a couple poll questions for us to kind of dive into. Um, let's pull those up now. So first, just want to do some check-ins. Let's see how we are all feeling at this moment. Are we feeling excited? Are we feeling happy, unsure, a little bit hungry? I mean, it is dinner time, tired. How is everyone feeling? Loving that. We have a lot of excited, a lot of happy, a lot of tired. You know, towards the end of the day, just gets a little tiring. Definitely. All right, I'm going to give it just a few more seconds and we'll close this one out and go on to our next one. Okay, so for our first one, um, definitely a lot of excited and happy, loving, loving that. Um, quite a few tired, but you know, we've got a fun conversation that we're going to dive into and a lot of like what if scenarios. So we have a lot of fun in store for us. Our next poll, kind of the classic, if we're talking Harry Potter, what house do you belong to? Are you Gryffindor with bravery? Are you Hufflepuff with that loyalty? Ravenclaw with intelligence? Um, or Slytherin with their ambition and cunning. Let's see. Me personally, I am I'm definitely a Hufflepuff through and through. That has always been my house. I did take one where they said I was a Gryffindor and was real swerved. It's never usually been the one I go for. What about you, Mike? What is your house? Oh, I am a uh, I am a Gryffindor and very much so. Have I been on screen the whole time? Because if so, people saw me fix my hair and we're just gonna roll with it. <laughs> <laughs> A little sneak peek. <laughs> amazing, amazing. Okay, I did not know that, but that's great. Uh, yeah, I'm a Gryffindor. I would say I'm like the most Gryffindor one can be legally. Uh, so I am quite, quite on that end of the of the, the spectrum there. I love it. I wonder, does anyone here not know what house they would be in? Guess out of those options, what sounds the best to you? But yeah, let's share these. So yeah, we have a huge number of Ravenclaws. That, we've got 34% of Ravenclaws here. We're pretty much tied for Gryffindor and Hufflepuff. And then we do got some Slytherins. You know, we, we do love our Slytherins. They're not all the evil villains in this. <laughs> yeah, I would also like to address in the in the chat, some people have said Slytherin and not racist, which is a Potterless joke. Whenever I do live streams and I have people do Q and A, and they say their house. And if you are from, if you are Slytherin, you have to clarify whether or not you're racist. Um, <laughs> because if you are, I won't answer your question. Because uh, that's all we see in the books. That's all they are. <laughs> I know that's that in it. real life they're beyond it. But in the books, it's like, what are we? The prejudiced people. <laughs> oh, cool. I love that house. They're very one note in the books, but you know, they're not in real life. They're yes. Real life. Agreed. 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 All right. So this one, um, which book in the series is your favorite? Are we loving Sorcerer's Stone, Chamber of Secrets, Prisoner of Azkaban, Goblet of Fire, Order of the Phoenix, Half-Blood Prince, Deathly Hollows? I feel like we all have very specific which book is our favorite. Mine personally, I love Half-Blood Prince. That one, I love the insight to, to Voldemort. That just was, I think, the perfect, which that movie let me down so, so hard. <laughs> But that one, that one's my favorite. That's what I'd be you know, voting for. How about you? Which I, my, fav my favorite book is The Sixth. I think it's, it's like right, it's got the right amount of suspense. There's no, it's short enough where like every chapter matters and there's no chapters that don't. Um, like I think her editor finally came back into the mix after taking off books four and five. 
and also you get really good Ginny moments in there, which I'm a big fan of. She amazing, amazing. Doing her and Luna, man, those are my mm-hmm. those are my favorite characters. They're fantastic. All right, let's see what we've got going here. So a lot of Prisoner of Azkaban, another, I mean, really, really great book. Um, got a sum for Order of the Phoenix, which we'll definitely be talking about a lot tonight. Sorcerer's Stone, and then Half-Blood Prince. And we got a few for Deathly Hollows. I like it. No, none. I'm surprised. I'm not so surprised with Chamber of Secrets, but Goblet of Fire. No, no takers this round. It's all the Ravenclaws. They're the nerds. They don't like sports. And that's the sports book. <laughs> that is the sports book. <laughs> you were very correct there. Yeah, I guess if the sports is not your thing, that's not your book. <laughs> all right. And so our last and final poll question throughout the series, have you noticed themes of mental health? Yes, no, or honestly, never thought about it. Which I, I, think would, this is I, a- would, I would choose like, yes, but poorly. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. I think there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of tidbits here and there that are kind of nuggets, or if you're obsessive with Harry Potter, it's where you do your own personal, like deep dives. Um, yeah, I think think there's a lot of things as we will get to over the course of the next hour, it's like things that start discussions, but discussions don't happen in the book. And I think that's almost why we want to have those discussions more is because like, wow, the book really didn't address this. Maybe we should talk about it because they just kind of like, I mean, there's no, like, there's no count. Like, we'll get into it. <laughs> there's nothing. Oh, yeah. There's no resources okay. for these children. <laughs> and I wish they would. I think that would drastically change so many plot points in this whole oh, series. Oh, yes. Like, it would also be a shorter series. Like, if Harry <laughs> ever told Dumbledore, like, hi, I, could you talk to me directly? But, oh, okay. And then it's like two less books. <laughs> yep that would have cleared up a lot real quick or if he didn't answer in riddles and just been like straight yeah, right like, if he hey, used sentences <laughs> the question you ask here is the actual answer not for you <laughs> to figure out and ponder all summer what a concept all right so we got a lot of yes loving that so definitely we're we're, we're examining a lot of harry potter a few no's and then honestly never thought about it which you know we're we're going to talk about it tonight Um, So right before we get going, and I let Mike introduce himself and everything that he's been working on, um, I do want to just point out, um, you know, we are going to be talking about the series at length. So if you are someone who this is your first time reading it or not fully caught up, you know, we do have a few spoilers we're going to be talking about just as a forewarning. Um, Also, you know, we are going to be discussing mental health related themes, um, you know, those surrounding depression, PTSD, childhood trauma. So if at any point during this conversation, you know, you feel like, whoa, that was a little much. Um, I kind of want to debrief or talk with someone. We do have Jerrica White in the, um, she's monitoring her chat. Just shoot her a private message. Um, she's one of our peer mentors here at NAMI Orange County, and she can definitely um, just kind of chat you through everything. Awesome. With that, um, I'm going to stop sharing the screen and I'm going to pass it off to Mike for his introductions. Hello. Um, if anyone if anyone in the chat is not familiar with who I am, my name is Mike Schubert. I am the, I'm the creator, host, uh, editor, and producer of Potterless, which is a podcast about Harry Potter where I never read the books as a kid. So it's me going through the series for the first time as an adult, uh, made my way through the books and then did spin off things like the movies and the play and some of the other books and then went on to do fan made stuff. Um, and I'm actually, this is the, uh, the last month of us uh, doing regular weekly episodes of Potterless, and then starting in September, I'm going to start doing a similar format, but for Percy Jackson. But there's over 190 episodes of Potterless out there right now. If you want to listen to that, it's wherever you get your podcasts, or you can go to PotterlessPodcast.com. Um, we're on social media as well. We've got a really fun Discord community where everyone is all fun, and we talk about Harry Potter stuff. So it's been it's been a good five year run and having these conversations is my favorite part of Harry Potter. Uh, Always my favorite thing is to talk deeper with fellow fans about some of the themes and stuff. That's, that's what I enjoy most. So I'm happy to be here doing more of that. Awesome. We are, we are so, so lucky and thankful to have you joining us tonight for this conversation. Um, I'm loving all of these comments in the chat so far. I mean, definitely you guys um, are right there with us of, of, seeing those areas where, you know, so much more could have been done. And so I think without further ado, let's, let's definitely crack into this. Um, So I want to kind of kick off this whole conversation of let's address, you know, those moments where there are themes that are, 
little are hinted at or metaphors for throughout this series, but they may not necessarily be totally positive. Um, so I think the biggest one that most people see right off the front is one that even the author herself has talked about quite a bit is that, you know, dementors have always been a metaphor for that depression. Um, you know, with, with how they kind of just creep about, you know, they fill you with that cold, with dread, with absolute fear, um, feeling like you can't move. And, and a lot of that too is, can be very similar to how actual depression feels, can be very hard to get past it. Um, you just feel kind of sad, a little bit lost. Um, and so I think with how she sets up Dementors, I mean, they're truly terrifying creatures within this wizarding world. Right. Yes, for sure. Um, I think I think Dementors is one of one of the like good examples, as opposed to I think a lot of the things we'll be talking about are, are shortcomings. But I think Dementors is a nice way, especially for a kid series novel, to try and find a way to describe an indescribable bad feeling. Well, Harry's first run in with the Dementors is that he doesn't really understand what's going on. Uh, and Lupin kind of coaches him through it. And I think that that is nice. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's a nice way where Lupin is always trying to make him, like, try to make Harry not feel embarrassed about it. The kids are trying to poke fun at him, but he's very reassuring that it's nothing to, to be ashamed of. It's just, this is what Dementors are, this is what they do. So I always thought what was nice about this plot is that Lupin is kind of there to, to guide Harry through it. Um, so I think that's, that's nice to show that, like, Lupin is Harry's support system. He's the person he can talk to about this. And it feels good because I feel like this is one of the first really true moments in this whole series where he does have a positive outlet, a support system to turn to and actually talk about all of this. Um, and he can get real about how, you know, I'm truly scared of these things. I don't want to hear flashbacks from my past. And it's not something we get a lot of before or throughout the series. Um, I think one thing that I've noticed is, you know, on the flip side of Dementors is you have your Patronus charm. And that is supposed to be, you think of like the happiest moment of your life. It's a very specific memory that's supposed to fuel you to get rid of Dementors. But I feel like this is something where it's not, definitely not as easy as it seems. And I think, right. you know, when you're at the, at the base level, looking at it going like, oh, it's just a happy memory. And we all have those. But I think if you're faced with a true Dementor and you're feeling those feelings, it's so, so difficult to change that around. Yeah, I think that's the shortcoming of the Dementor analogy here is that the answer is just like, oh, just think happy thoughts, uh, which like feels almost like the, the, the lazy approach when, when people hear about depression. They're like, oh, why don't you just like do something that makes you happy? It's like, that's not what depression means. So yeah, I, I, it's, they, they kind of get into it when, when they're doing the Patronus charm, where it's more than just thinking about happy memories, et cetera. But at its core, it is just like, oh yeah, just think of that really happy moment and then you're gonna be just fine. And that is, that is not necessarily the way to fight off depression or any sort of you know more severe yeah. level of sadness or bad feelings that you have going on. Definitely. And, and I, I do appreciate that throughout it, they acknowledge too um, that not everyone is capable of producing even just a regular silvery mist, let alone a full-bodied Patronus that is very, very difficult right. to do. You know, you, you watch all year of Harry's struggle to do it until he's, you know, faced with death, <laughs> right. for lack of a better right there, to save himself, yeah. as he always does. Um, but I, I, I do appreciate that they, they do highlight the struggle it is to create. I think until you get to the fifth book and then it feels like everyone can do a Patronus. It's no big yeah. deal. <laughs> yeah, they set it up well at first where it's it's not necessarily the easiest thing. Lupin really has to coach Harry through. It is disappointing that Lupin, who appears to be like the only person that Harry can really, the only adult that Harry can really talk to at the school about what's going on, he has to leave the next year. So <laughs> like the school that already doesn't have any sort of guidance counselor or therapist or person he can talk to, like the one voice of reason he can talk to, he, he doesn't get to anymore. So that's, that's a bit of a sad note in terms of just Harry having someone to discuss all of this with. Yes. I think while we're on the topic of Lupin, I kind of want to dive into his character. And maybe sure. a few other characters, because we do, she does bring up quite a bit throughout the series, you know, these interesting or really eccentric characters or people who are really out there. But I like 
lupins in particular, because, you know, he is a werewolf. So I, I think she built a really nice where werewolves are the outcasts of the wizarding community. You know, they're seen as evil. They're, they live in their own communities. They can't get jobs. They, you know, there's so much stigma surrounding them and, and who they are. Um, I think it was a, it's a great parallel if you look at it. And I don't know if this was fully intentioned when she wrote it, probably, probably not, <laughs> but <laughs> I think it does a really nice job of painting that picture of, of that stigma when there is, you know, an illness that we're not sure of or, um, you know, unsure how to deal with um, mental health, um, especially or when someone has a mental illness is you kind of feel like pushing that aside or even as yourself, like Lupin does it to himself quite a bit um, where he goes, no, I need to shy away from people. Nobody understands me. And I think that's a very common, common feeling. Yeah, I think the Lupin analogy, when you're talking, when you're talking about like the the outcast nature and trying to make a commentary on like how how rude people are to werewolves, I think that that works. But I just I just talked with we did an episode of Potterless about some of the shortcomings of diversity and representation in Harry Potter with uh, Delia Gallegos from Black Rose Create and Michael Harley, and we were talking about this Lupin specific thing. And the the problem with this analogy becomes because I think J.K. Rowling was public about how it was the werewolf Lupin situation was supposed to be an allegory for having HIV AIDS. The mm -hmm. problem with it is when you is when the story continues and every werewolf is bad except for Lupin, and then we never hear about how things go when he talks and meets with the other werewolves. And then you have Fenrir Greyback as like the only other werewolf that we meet. And he is a guy who actively wants to specifically bite children. So then it gets bad of, oh, this isn't great because now you've, if you are intentionally using this as a metaphor for how people react to someone affected with an illness, specifically if you're going for HIV AIDS, you've also painted them as monsters. So it, it's like, it was one that I think started off okay with book three, but then wasn't fully realized. And the way the story kind of developed doesn't, doesn't look too great. Um, but before it got into the later stuff, I agree that it, 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 do, it does work in terms of talking about stigma specifically. And like the whole point of the story is you're supposed to feel bad for Lupin that people are being unnecessarily rude to him for no good reason. Um, I just think that like as the story develops, it kind of, it kind of falls flat without like being nicely tied up. Totally true. And, and I, I feel that where, you know, there's always that, I feel like when mental health or mental illness portrayed in characters and media um, throughout, you know, they're, they're usually the, the bad guy or, you know, there's some sort of evil or you're fighting those sides of yourself, um, which isn't, isn't necessarily true or accurate or, or even a great way to portray that. I mean, we could look at it too of, of Hagrid being a giant or half giant and mm -hmm. immediately like Ron freaks and is like, oh my gosh, he might turn on us, who knows? Right. And, but they don't showcase the other giants. They just showcase them as they're wild and, and violent and, and live on their own and they're, they're no good, except for Hagrid. He's, he's good. So I think, yes. I, I think once we take our, our good characters, you, there's a lot of that niceness where it's like, okay, we presented it. You can still have a fulfilling life, but then there's all these bad ones. Um, and I think that muddies the, the, the highlighting or the goodness of that. Right. Yeah. You know, another, another character, which one of my favorites is Luna Looney Lovegood. Um, you know, she gets a lot of slack for being weird and they straight up call her crazy throughout the entire series and not great, not great at all. Just because she's a little eccentric or has different viewpoints as everyone else doesn't make her completely insane. And they, they, I mean, they really laid it on thick in that fifth book of like, Ooh, that's not a good thing to be compared like her. And that really freaked Harry out when he was having a lot of similarities with her, where he's like, oh my gosh, I don't want to be seen as a weird kid. Yeah, I think this is another example of like, uh, of a commentary done well, because I, I feel like everyone reading it understands that people are being unnecessarily rude to Luna. It's pretty clear that people are not treating her well, she's not bothered by it, and people who actually get to know her really like her. And I think it's admirable how little she cares 
about the fact that people like her her nickname being loony like that's rough and the fact that she's just completely unbothered by it and marches to the beat of her own drum and is very comfortable in herself uh i think that that's really nice so i think that that's done well that's one of those where the commentary that they're going for is made clear and mm -hmm. it's just the fact that yes people try to ostracize her because she's different that is wrong and she's completely unfazed by it and it makes me love luna even more oh my gosh a completely unfazed she i mean the fact that she just beats to her own drum and is like this is who i am take it or leave it up to right. you like she doesn't make excuses and I love that with her character and I think it's a very nice role model when you're a kid reading these books and going like yeah I should be more like that and I like that right. you know it changes her friends once they do get to know her where they yeah. you know come to defend her when other people are just being rude <laughs> right and I don't know if this is a sign of the times or just the people that I surround myself with but when I read it if Luna was in school now she would be the coolest person in school like she would be the most popular student in all of Hogwarts. <laughs> she is certainly the coolest person. So I, I don't know. I obviously am not in middle school slash high school uh, and have not been for a while. So I don't know how the dynamics would fit in, but I just feel like with the way things are moving, where individuality is more, uh, is like more championed and yeah. praised, I feel like in today's age, Luna would absolutely thrive. I, or at I least agree. thrive with the right people and to the right audience, the people that matter, not the bullies of the school that we do not care about. Exactly. We, we ignore that. But mm -hmm. I agree. I think, I think that definitely goes to just show how much, how much further things have come. Because, I, yeah, I feel like when going through middle school, oh, my gosh, if you had been that person, I just change schools, change your name, don't, don't mm -hmm. come back. <laughs> but right, nowadays, right, right, I mean, right. that individuality is so celebrated and is is you know something you strive for um i think she's she's just further how much of a great character um she has written sad she's only like from book five and on <laughs> a, sh a shame indeed i know i know so another theme within the series that i think we're gonna be talking quite a bit especially in this next um chunk is is that ptsd i think we see lots and lots of it and, and rightfully so. I mean, Harry has the most tragic background of a character in a series. Each year, more tragedy surrounds him. So it's almost impossible to not come out of this unscathed in some way, shape, or form. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think we see it a lot within, you know, the early series when he has those flashbacks of his parents, but doesn't fully understand what it is. Mm -hmm. um, book, book five is... Book the definition. Five. Yeah, <laughs> book book five is what really happens. And I, I remember if if I wasn't doing Potterless when I was reading book five, I would have stopped reading Harry Potter at book five. Because as narrator Harry, he's so frustrating. And I'm very thankful to the Potterless community. They've pointed out a lot of different things to me. And my first read through is just like, wow, Harry is being such a grumpy teenager. And a lot of people pointed out like, look, he just went through a whole lot and he's not dealing with it well. And, I, and then upon reflection afterwards, it makes sense. Like, okay, yes, that makes a lot of sense. And this is where I think that one of the, one of the shortcomings with book five, Harry specifically, is that like he is going through a lot, but they never, they never like talk about it. They never address it. And uh, there's there's plenty of examples of people like starting to or trying to like Hermione a little bit, Ron a little bit, or it's like very clear that Harry is treating people poorly. But at no point in the story does anyone really take Harry aside and talk about it. So I feel like this is something that when your audience is mostly children and young adults. I feel like you should probably make it a little bit more clear, like, hello, the reason that Harry is being very grumpy and lashing out at people that he loves is because he's, you know, you don't have to make it break the fourth wall obvious, but I feel like there could have been some sort of conversation where like Lupin pulls him aside or Sirius pulls him aside. And I would have to reread the book to see if anything like that happens. But mm -hmm. I just remember my initial reading of it being that that wasn't really explained to me in the book clearly, but the community did. And I feel like JK in the longest book could have put a little thing about like a bit more, if that's what she's going for, which I think she was, 
I feel mm-hmm. like you could have done a little more explaining about like, here's why, here's what's behind this. 100%. And I, I was in the same, I, I read these growing up as a kid. And, and I remember very much being a kid reading this book and going, oh my gosh, like, I know, I know it's rough right now. Like I'm feeling you, but woof, that was a lot. And I mean, I, that's why I completely took a break. I think the sixth book was out and I was like, oof. Don't know if I need to go back to that. If Harry is still going to be as angsty as he is, like yeah. that was that was kind of rough. Going back and reading it as an adult, I I feel like it it's completely changed my perception of it because you you really start to identify like yeah like he just witnessed his friend and teammate getting killed. He you know saw his nemesis re reborn and right. going, oh no, I'm not protected anymore. Yeah. And things are about to get real, real. And then you're immediately cut off from everyone. And he's left so isolated that you're like, of course, like I would be so angry with everyone. And then to have no one to talk to or turn to while you're reliving these traumatic, I mean, very traumatic moments is, is difficult. So of course he's you know, angsty Harry. <laughs> right. He, and then, <laughs> oh, I was going to say, and and things even get worse for Harry in the fifth book because he loses Sirius very abruptly. And you get a little bit of a conversation of, of Lupin talking to him after it. And I do think one of the, the, the nice scenes is Luna talking with Harry because Luna um, lost her mom. And Rosa in the comments here um, said that she wished Luna could have gone more into that. I think that would have been really nice because it's a nice conversation. It doesn't last very long. And I feel like those conversations with the Lupin and Luna happened towards the end of book five. I really like the end of book five. Those conversations started to happen, but then they don't really continue into book six because we've got so much Horcrux plot stuff to do um, that it doesn't really get discussed. And multiple people in the comments here have also said stuff about um, Alice and Frank Longbottom, which agree, because that's another situation of Neville's going through some of that. So maybe Harry and Neville could have talked, but, you know, Harry just ignores <laughs> Neville for six and a half books. But I, f- I feel like there, there were discussions, like, started in book five. They weren't, like, fully brought out. I feel like they, there could have been a little bit more to address like why Harry is so angry so that the conversation around it, I feel like the more common thing, like even you said, the more common thing is for people to call it angsty Harry, which like more accurately it's PTSD Harry, but I just don't think the book itself makes it clear enough that that's what's going on. Um, and for a young adult and children audience, I think it should be a bit, you can make it more clear uh, and and make sure that that's the interpretation that the audience gets out of the story. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. I'm liking some of these too, where, um, I mean, Alice and Frank, I, so many of Harry's classmates, I mean, all their parents went through the first Wizarding War, and I think it was affected a lot of people. So I think a lot of these students have some sort of trauma in their, in their backstory or their childhood that they've dealt with that Harry could definitely have turned to some of his friends and, and they might have understood. Um, I, I'm seeing one where it was even like, did Ginny get therapy after having Voldemort in her head for a year? I mean, that needs to be talked about a whole lot more besides just her saying like, well, we shouldn't write in things or take notes from books. Like that's all it's ever touched on of like, hey, like he literally yep. possessed my mind. Um, and to have something that kind of, that dark in you, I mean, that, that can you know, that's not great. <laughs> yeah, especially at such a young age. And Kate also in the comments saying that uh, Harry has trust issues. He can't really talk to anyone. It makes sense. He doesn't, like, imagine if the school had someone that he could talk to, that would go a long way. Uh, and then also the, another, I, I forgot that this was also in book five, but like another theme is, hey, Dumbledore, the one person I kind of talked to about the stuff is kind of being weird and ignoring me and is being kind of shuddered and not telling me everything. And that throws Harry for a loop too. So so there's, there's a lot of stuff that is going wrong for Harry in book five. And I don't think enough discussion, like you get, a, of course, like Dumbledore apologizes and stuff in the end, but I don't know. It just shows that even just outside of like the commentary of what the book is trying to do, uh, it just shows that Hogwarts, like within the canon, is just so poorly run, just a poorly run institution that is not doing enough for these children. Like, yeah, Ginny totally should have had someone to talk to. That is wild. She was possessed by the most evil wizard. 
at age 11. Come on. Yes. Oh. As, as a first year student, it yes. wasn't even like her as a seventh year and can process. No, she was 11 years old. And that's mm-hmm. a scary, scary thing to be at a boarding school away from your support system and being like, yep, just become homies with Voldemort. <laughs> right. Yeah. Gosh. It, can't imagine yeah. going through that at age 11. I can't either. That was a fantastic point. I, it's one I never even like thought of even mm-hmm. going through this. And, and how many times throughout the series, I mean, I feel like Harry does not in full truth and honesty, but he does always reach out to these teachers of like, hey, shady things are happening. Maybe we should look at this. And they go, no, 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 no. You just, you just pipe down, sit back in your seat. We, we, we're fine. It's fine. Yeah. Harry's mistake is that he didn't talk to McGonagall enough because every time he talks to McGonagall, she does a good job of calming him down and telling him what's up and helping him. And she proves time and time again that she wants the best for Harry. But uh, Harry, Harry should have been in McGonagall's office all the time. Like every, like every day. You should have like checked in with her because she was the one who was really, really helpful and there on a consistent basis in the school. I think Sirius was there too, but he was not around and then died. Uh, And then Lupin, same thing. He was there, but then not around and then had to leave and do werewolf reconnaissance. But McGonagall was always there. He should have talked to her so much more than he did. He was at least the one stable, tried and true, always had his best interests at heart. Where, you know, we, we can debate all day about Dumbledore, because that one is a very complicated Spicy. relationship. Um, but yeah, I mean, she always was like, I have your back, like, come to me and, and we'll, we'll work it out and, and, and puts him in his place when it's like, this is not for you to figure out. This is for us to figure out. Just sit back. We got right. it. And, and yeah, I think if you'd gone to her a little bit more, maybe, maybe things would be slightly different. It's just like, you have your weekly check-in with her, not Snape, because I don't know why that, oh. that was a good idea. <laughs> Gosh, terrible idea. Terrible idea. Yes. So talk good. to the, talk to the guy who actively is holding a grudge with your dead father. Like that's, <laughs> that's who he's, he, who's still not over what your dad did to him decades ago. He's the guy you should talk to about, you know, keeping Voldemort out of your brain. But mm-hmm. Yeah. Definitely a shortcoming. Uh, and, and then another book five thing, another another character that I think is a bit like ostracized and put on the side is Cho Chang. Like just completely mistreated in that series of, oh, wow, look how, look, it's the crying girl. What a drama queen. Like, no, her boyfriend died. Like she is not being overdramatic. She's being normal. You, all of you who think she's being <laughs> overdramatic, you're the ones that are being strange because clearly she just needs someone to talk to at the school Ugh, that that one I think and I don't I don't even think that was like a JK trying to make a commentary thing um because like Ron you kind of get that one when, when Ron is weird to Hagrid it does come up of what hey Ron like that wasn't so nice he's like you're right that wasn't but like with Cho Harry Ron other people in school are all completely rude to her and then at no point in the series is it brought up that that is uh that that is what JK was going after. I think she just completely mishandled the situation. Uh, yeah. And people are just needlessly cruel to her for no reason. She just, she clearly needs someone to talk to. 100%. I mean, that is, because I think, yeah, she's a year above Harry, I believe, in the book. Yes. Yeah. So yes. sixth year, as a fifth year, your first, probably first boyfriend just came mm-hmm. out of the games and was no longer with us. And you had one summer to process this. Like that's not, not nearly enough time and definitely not for that character. And then, you know, I, I think it was always just the, the bit of like humor of like, oh, let's how, how ridiculous Harry and Ron are because, you know, they just don't get emotions and women are emotional, but it, it you know, no, like she's struggling just as much as everyone else is at the end of everything that happened at book four. Um, I have to point out, I'm loving these comments right now because we have um, really the counselors could have been the head of houses, but then once again, we've got Snape as the counselor and how good would that have been? <laughs> but he might've been good for his students because he does like his, his house. As long as we don't right. have to cross. But yeah, like Mag- McGonagall would be good for Gryffindor. Sprout would be great for Hufflepuff. Fluig, I think, would be good for Ravenclaw. So yeah, I think that I think that could have worked. But then they also have to teach classes. Like Hogwarts needs someone where like their entire job is just to talk to wizards. Uh, especially, even if it wasn't a thing in the beginning, maybe when Voldemort, when 
people publicly knew Voldemort was back after book four, like it would have been great at the at the year five opening feast where Dumbledore is like, hey, uh, the most evil wizard is back in town. If you need to talk to someone about it, here's, you know, Madam so-and-so and mm -hmm. you can talk to them. Um, but yeah, I, other, other things people are pointing out in the comments is that just like at the time when the books were coming out, mental health had a lot of stigma around it. And that finds its way into the series as well. Um, Kate saying that like there was a point in Chamber of Secrets where Harry's told that hearing voices in your head is bad even in mm -hmm. even in the wizarding world so yeah I think I think a little a little bit of it is product of the time stuff I also think a little bit of it is uh we we kind of now see uh, who JK Rowling might be as a person as opposed to who we thought she was so could be like not not the best approach to to those sort of things but yeah I it I think just really what could have fixed so many things is if the kids just had someone at the school as a resource that they could actually talk to because I don't know, a lot of kids go through a lot of different things and it's unfortunate that they don't really have an adult presence on a regular basis that they can have conversations with. 100%. I mean, even when things were happening and they are trying to dispel these rumors or find out actual facts, I mean, you have to like pressure a teacher to finally let up or trick them into telling you what's going on so you go okay some this has happened before like chamber secrets this has happened before they couldn't find it the first time we are probably a little bit in trouble this time around <laughs> and and they had to they had in the movies I think it was McGonagall that did it in the books it, they totally tricked Professor Binns to let them know like hey here's the facts nothing more nothing less but just so you guys know, you can you can stop doing the rumor mill. Um, but it's it is sad that there's there's no one to to fully discuss everything. I mean, even in Dumbledore speeches, it's like, hey, don't go to the third floor, you might die. And it's like, how is that just glam right. over? <laughs> mm -hmm. Like, are we good yes. with that? <laughs> right. Yeah. I think, and even even some of the other things that happen, uh, just about like uh, someone in the comment pointed out, like people can't agree if if. Who actually killed Cedric? Um, because you've got the Ministry of Magic trying to to do a big cover up job and stuff. And I think Dumbledore, in one of the the closing speeches, addresses that fudge or you know whatever's going on. They're they're not being truthful. Um, but yeah, I feel like you would want to step in because you have the the side plot of Seamus being angry at Harry and not really believing him. And you know you've got the the one newspaper. Uh, the one person, uh, like the one news source is saying that Harry's a bad person and he's behind this and he's lying and all of that. I feel like it, it's the duty of Dumbledore as the headmaster of the school to try to defend Harry more publicly and make it clear to the students what is going on as opposed to just like waiting till the end of the year to talk about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then allowing someone like Umbridge to come and teach at the school, which, oh my gosh, she should oh. never have been around kids. Not at all. Not at all. Oh, but I mean, to and then to have that conflicting, you're already having that within the one news source. I mean, really, we're not, we're not got a whole lot of differing opinions out there, but with a lot of people even debating, yeah, what actually happened. Um, and then to bring another outside influence into the school to, you know, battle with Dumbledore, what actually happened. I mean, it's, it's a lot to process and yeah, you don't know. And now all of a sudden friends who you thought were friends, aren't your friends anymore. Cause you disagree. And, and it makes it just that much harder, that, that much harder. Yeah. Or, sure. All right. I think, so there's certain scenarios that definitely pop up in this book. And one of the biggest ones that, you know, already puts Harry, I think in a troubling spot is him just growing up at the Dursleys. Yeah. <laughs> like, not great. Not great. Um, the fact that he lives under a cupboard, I mean, not, not a fantastic start. Um, you know, it's very apparent how much he's not loved. Um, very apparent how much he's not wanted there. And to take that and, and go to school and all of a sudden be around people who are like, you're amazing. You're fantastic. I mean, that alone is kind of like a little weird, uh, dual complex right there. But what drove me crazy the whole time I'm reading this book is these teachers know, I mean, McGonagall knew right off the bat, like, hey, this is not going to be a good situation for him to live in and grow up in. And you're going to knowingly leave him here. 
Yeah, a wild decision by Dumbledore. His his reasoning is, oh, I didn't. I wanted you to stay humble, so I'm going to put you in this horrible situation. Like there has to be a middle ground between Dursleys and having Harry grow up and be too full of himself. And I I can understand from like writing a compelling story perspective that it it is it sets the stage for a lot and and it you know has Harry overcoming this horrible situation and that's feel good. It is weird that it is an intentional choice by Dumbledore to do this, where there were other options in place. I feel like if you're trying to do that, JK, you probably could have just made it some sort of reason that Harry had to grow up with them, as opposed to Dumbledore being like, this is going to be great for his character. It's just a terrible, terrible situation for, for someone to grow up in. Just awful. Just being completely mistreated for the first decade of your life. Ugh. Yes. And at least he had the Weasleys there who, you know, would, I think by like book two, I mean, they were trying to yank him out of there as quickly as possible because th- that you ha- right. he had that excuse of he has to go back because it's protection. Oh yeah, right. The protection trying like, okay, sure. Cool. Ridiculous. Yes. <laughs> he has to undergo at least a, at least a week of abuse and then he's good to go on his merry way. I think, yeah, there were a lot better options to, to humble him, to make him, you know, not relish in his fame. Um, I mean, heck, stay with Mrs. Fig. I mean, she was pretty yeah. low key and chill and was living outside of the wizard world. I mean, that would have been a way better option than the Dursleys. Totally. I, f- I feel like for everyone knowing what the Harry Potter situation was with his parents dying from Voldemort, I feel like someone like a Mrs. Fig or anyone else could have I don't know, have an application process or something where someone can adopt Harry and he doesn't have to live with people that Dumbledore knows are not going to be good for him. Uh, it's just yeah. is a very, a very wild, wild decision. But then, yeah, I mean, I think that kind of, that kind of explains, I, I know one thing that people, listeners pointed out to me that I think makes a lot of sense is a frustrating point that I always had with the books was Harry not asking enough questions. And people pointed out to me that Petunia kind of in in plants in his brain that asking questions is bad and that could explain why harry is so hesitant to do so is just because it was just told to him again and again to you know keep to himself and to to not ask questions again this is one of those things where like i don't know if jk intentionally did this or people are reading between the lines but regardless it just shows further proof as to why that was such a bad situation for him to spend the earliest years of his life Completely. I mean, yeah, to grow up like that, you have people who, you know, verbally tell you they don't want you there. You are a burden on them. So he never has had adults in his life that have been like, yes, come, come talk to me or come ask me questions or be that solid support system. He's only known, you know, you, we don't want you. So just stay quiet, make sure we don't know you're here and things will work out. And and that really does play through I mean, even with Ron and Hermione, I mean, there are many a moments where he's like, I got this, I'll do it solo. You guys stay out of the way. And they're like, no, no, like we're here. We're, we're part of this trio We're and we're coming. Um, and, and I mean, all the way through to the seventh book, I mean, he very much wants to do it alone. He, part of it, he wants to protect everyone, but I think a huge part is he's never had that fully solid support system. And the second he does, it usually gets taken away from him. Um, so it's very, very difficult. Very difficult. Yeah. Just, just a a terrible situation to start in. Um, and then another thing is just like, he, he has that as, as a starting point, but then also just consistently throughout the series, he is just time and time again, dealing with someone trying to kill him every single year. And then, and yes. then, as you said earlier in the chat, like all Dumbledore does is is toss riddles his direction as his only form of of trying to deal with it. And yeah, it's Dumbledore's lack of concern for Harry's mental well being and also just like his physical well being of, of not dying. Um, like Dumbledore steps in there, but I, I get that Dumbledore apologizes in the end of book five for kind of messing this up. But it's just it is very disappointing that. Dumbledore we learn he kind of used Harry as a pawn and then just wasn't checking in all the time to make sure everything was okay and being a constant source and was doing a lot of things behind the scenes and keeping Harry out of the loop and thinking that that would be in Harry's best interest if he didn't know what's going on because there's a lot on his plate and 
it's, it is just a rough situation for Harry to be in. He's so young, he's dealing with so much. And then his one main resource who kind of explains everything to him and helps him through stuff is intentionally trying to withhold information from him because he thinks that's what's best for him without ever talking to Harry about that. And that is just very disappointing on Dumbledore's part. Oh yeah. I, th- I always found it very frustrating that, you know, Harry has these questions pretty much all year long of like, I'm hearing voices. That's kind of strange. I'm not sure what's going on with that, but I have no mm-hmm. one to ask because I've been told don't ask, um, you know, and, and leaving these full on explanations until the very end of, Hey, so you survived. Great. Kudos to you. Um, we got close there, but we made it. And so here's how you made it. And here's all these things that I put in place to ensure that you make it in case these scenarios turn up. I mean, just alone in that, in the first book at the end of that, I mean, he, not even getting into, I know in the books, it's a little bit different where I think it's more Voldemort that ends up killing Coral, but like in the movies, I mean, that's, that's Harry. (laughs) Um, And so he's 11, just narrowly escaped death for the first time. Well, I guess the second time. And I mean, he was part of that undoing of of a teacher. And that's not even really addressed besides like Mm-mm. your mother's love is what, you know, undid him. And, and right. it's, it's all for that and it's good and it's happy, but you know, I mean, that's, that's a lot to process at 11. Like, Hey, I was part of getting rid of a teacher. <laughs> yeah. I, it's, it's a lot to deal with from the jump and then just something happens every book. And I understand that this is a book series, so you need to have a villain every year. And I understand that it's the way JK writes stuff. It's, it's usually suspenseful and you're trying to figure out what, what happens and it's like mystery esque. Um, and in my case, you, you're guessing what happens incorrectly, but like, it's, it's, it feels like for the sake of plot, like Harry's well-being is just consistently tossed aside. And it's it's a shame just like when you think about him as a as a person and as a character, what happens to him and just like how much he kind of has to do on his own. And it's something that when I was reading the books, I kind of I time and time again was just like, wow, Harry is just making such rash decisions. And you know, he's if if only he like I didn't think very highly of Harry until I got to the end of the series and, you know, with the Dumbledore reveal and things that listeners have pointed out to me a lot, like it makes it more clear all of the stuff that Harry's going through and how little help he gets towards doing all of those. Um, and then just, oh, I'm trying to think of where, <laughs> where I was going with this, but like he, he's just, he goes, he goes through so, so much. And uh, I think like later on, oh, later on in the series, like his, the fact that Harry is selfless enough to just basically willingly walk into the forest, just completely confront death knowing and thinking that like, this is it, I am going to, this is going to be the end of me. And then that's, that's all. And I need to do this to save everyone. I'm 17 years old, but like, oh, I had a good run. And uh, I, I think that's where I gained a lot of respect for Harry. And by that time, I had also had a lot of people thankfully point out to me you know, Harry's going through so much, it kind of explains some of his more rash decisions and, and times he lashes out at folks. And it just makes me, it makes me just feel so sad for him that there wasn't a lot around him to, to help him out. Yeah, I, it's, it's very, very, once you like actually tally everything up of, you know, it, it would really suck to be Harry at times. Cause yeah, someone's always trying to, to get you. You kind of have this fear with you every, everywhere you go. Um, I feel like once things really start looking up for him, it kind of gets turned around. And yes, it's it's a story, so you have to always have your your villains and and the points to set our, our characters back or help them grow. But yeah, I mean, you just can't help but feel so bad by the end of that of like, oh, we did all of this together and just to lead us here. Um, you know, luckily. It's Harry. We can't, we can't undo Harry. So he's, you know, always makes his way out of it. But, you know, you, you really start to feel for the character, especially reading it again as, as an adult and you know more um, of just experiencing life and going, geez, he doesn't, he's not as strong as he is. Like he has his flaws and, and they're created from all this childhood back trauma and, and it's, it's hard. But I do like Rosa in the comments did say like, 
you know, trauma doesn't make you stronger. And I think that's a lot of what we see is, is he has all this built up trauma and it's there to make him a strong, humble character. And he can make these decisions and he can do these hard tasks because he's Harry Potter and he's, he's mastered everything, but you know, it's, that's not always the case. And it really does glamorize it a little bit. Yeah. Um, I, I agree. I think there's so many people in the comments making like lots of really good points about all the, all the different things uh, just with, with Harry and Dumbledore and all of that. And it's, it's something that I feel like book seven did a little bit of a better job with it, with the reveal of Dumbledore. I think it did do a good job of kind of showing, kind of shows you that, oh wow, sorry for the sirens. I live in New York city. Um, the, uh, uh, I think like in book seven, you kind of get the reveal that, oh, maybe Dumbledore isn't, isn't the best. So that gives you a better appreciation or at least a better understanding for some of the things in the earlier parts of the series. Like if you read book five and you were confused about why Dumbledore is being so strange and stuff like that, then you get to think, then you get to think like, oh, I get it. Because before we had this reveal, I thought Dumbledore was great. And now I get to realize he's not. So I think book seven kind of helps with some of the discussions of, of recognizing that not everybody is perfect, even the people that earlier on in the books we thought was just like the top of the top people that we should always, you know, think are doing the right thing at all times. Um, so I think that that was nice. But yeah, I mean, it would have been nicer if there were if there were things throughout the story uh, that kind of talked about this more. And I think maybe it is just that's what happens when you're writing a book back then. And I think things are more on it now. And and I've just started to read Percy Jackson. I'm only a couple of chapters into the first book, but it seems like they're doing a better job with that. His his ADHD and his dyslexia, dyslexia has already come up multiple times and characters are trying to talk to him about it. I know that that was like an intentional choice that uh, the author Rick Reardon made. So I would just hope that more and more in young adult series that are going forward, these kind of things can be addressed and you know talked in a way where it, it breaks down the stigma, it breaks down and has conversations about these things so that it's not relying on us having these these conversations and stuff, but it's more clear in the books. And that's a way for kids to either understand it on their own or have their parent like open the door for their parents to have conversations. Or, you know, if you do it as summer reading, your teachers can can talk about it. Like I think those are all important things that I I would hope for YA series of the future, that uh, it's it's something that just kind of breaks down all the different stigmas that were that were around like you see with Cho being the oh you're the weird crying girl like no she's being the regular emotion girl like she's <laughs> she's expressing the incredibly normal emotions for the situation that she's in everyone deals with grief differently and that you know I I love your your points that you made there where I think you know a lot of it is probably definitely just sign of the times of when this was written and there mm -hmm. are series out there where you know it's being talked about. They have more supportive systems in place and it's showcased because I mean, as kids, we, and especially if you're a heavy reader or love these fantasy, I mean, you become so immersed in these worlds and you really latch onto these characters when you have those similarities or you connect with. So I think the more that these these authors can really reduce that stigma surrounding it, realizing like it's okay to talk about these things. It's okay to experience things differently. Um, you know, I think it's a really positive thing for our next generations and, and really helping reduce stigma surrounding many things, um, not just mental illness or health, um, you know, making it more comfortable. Yeah, definitely. I, it's something that I think media is definitely getting better about just from seeing, seeing the way some of the like movies and TV shows are now, even just watching some of the, the kids shows that my niece watches. Like, I think things are, things are getting better, which is really nice. And I would just hope that it just continues to improve from here on out. Definitely. And I love that as, as all of us being fans of these series and, and loving them, you know, we're able to look at them and see where, you know, there are shortcomings or how far we've grown from, you know, when this was all written or, or, you know, just examining these furthers and having these conversations, I think just really helps propel, um, propel it even more. But yeah. sadly, 
that hour just flew by just like that. It always does. It always oh, does. <laughs> that clock, man, it's staring you down. But I want to give you a chance to kind of deep dive into all your other amazing podcasts that you have, um, new stuff you have coming up. I know you've been touring as well. So let us know where we can connect with you and, and find you next. Sure. Uh, I have a website with all of the stuff. It's Chubes, so S-C-H-U-B dot E-S. But basically, in addition to Potterless, I host a, I co-host a podcast called Horse, which is about basketball, but just the, the fun elements. So we talk about the WNBA and the NBA, just the entertaining things and the wild stories of the current and past. Uh, I also host a game show for charity called Meddling Adults, where guests compete to solve children's mysteries from series like Encyclopedia Brown or Scooby-Doo, and then the uh, whoever whoever wins earns money for a charity of their choice. And then, as I mentioned, starting in September, I'll be doing a similar structure of Potterless, but for Percy Jackson, more so in the quest, like more of the Potterless was like, oh, look at me, I'm an adult who grew up in the, I was writing the wheelhouse of Harry Potter and I should, and I can't believe I didn't read it. This one is more of like, because I think a lot of people this will be their first time reading and they'll use it as a digital book club. The, the thought more around this podcast is like, have we all been collectively sleeping on Percy Jackson? And is this the book series that should be like the Harry Potter that like, should it be at that level? Um, and was it just done dirty because the movies were bad? Shout out Chris Columbus for ruining the first two movies. Um, so that's coming out. And then in October, I'm working at the plan is for the show that I launch a Kickstarter for, Modern Muckraker, to release. And that's going to be a comedic uh, investigative journalism podcast where I will be playing a character who's convinced he's doing the world's most important research, but in actuality is answering very silly questions such as when should Spider-Man take the subway instead of web swinging. Um, so all of those are coming out uh, and that's that's what I've got going on. But yeah, Potterless live shows are happening um, in, as as we can uh, with, with with the world right now and stuff. So there's a lot going on. Um, but I'm I'm just a I'm a busy boy. But I have fun doing this as my job. <laughs> Love it. Yeah, definitely a lot going on your end. I I'm definitely on the pro Percy Jackson. You know, definitely missed its its stride with those movies. I'm very about that, but amazing book series. I am a huge Greek mythology um, buff. So having something in a contemporary setting is just, oh my gosh, blew my mind. Um, so, so excited for that. But we do have up here, I know Jerrica dropped in the chat a couple times, um, links so you can look up his other um, podcasts and definitely keep an eye out, follow him on social media so you can see when his new um, podcasts get released. They all sound yeah. super exciting. Um, so we've got those there. And then just to wrap things up, um, I do want to go over just a few of the resources that we do offer here at NAMI that are, you know, specifically for our teens and young adults. Um, so one of the first ones is our OC warm line. So this is our free and confidential telephone service um, that is there to provide emotional support or resources to our Orange County residents. Um, it's available 24 seven, you can call or text um, our number, it's 714-991-6412. Um, and really our staff is just there to chat if you ever need a ear to listen to or have someone listen to you. Um, if you're curious about what resources are free in our area, they have that whole database for you to access. Um, next up, we have our teen and young adult program. So happy hour is one of our programs we do twice a month here at NAMI. Um, this is our chance to just take an hour of mental health wellness. Um, we do activities, we have discussions like this, um, which is a lot of fun. One of our other monthly events is Honest Hour. Um, it's where we take a look at different mental health related topics um, and have a full panel that just does deep dive discussion. And it's a chance for you guys to ask any questions that you have revolving mental health. Um, so those are two of our monthly events that we do. We also do other one-off events um, here and there. We also share community resources. So if you ever want to just see what's going on, um, you can definitely check out what's on that page. It's constantly being updated as well. Face-to-face. Um, -face. So this is a newer program we offer here at NAMI. Um, it is a peer mentorship program 
that we offer through Zoom. And so with this peer mentor is there once again, just to help provide that additional emotional support. Um, if you know you just need someone to talk to, they're there to you know, help you find resources to discuss anything you wanna discuss. And the amazing thing is it's open to those 16 and ups and you'll be matched with a mentor that you know, has that same lived in experience, can really connect with you, whether it's, you know, your age range, um, things that you're personally going through, we do our best to match you as closely as possible. So you have that deep connection. Um, you can sign up for that on our website. Um, Jerrica is dropping the links for that in the chat. And then finally, um, Nam C is on Spotify. We all love music. Um, and I really feel like the music has is a great, great self-care tool. So each month we do put together a special playlist that highlights our monthly themes that we have here at NAMI. Um, and we play those during our happy hours, um, during Honest Hour, and you can find those playlists on Spotify. So we also are dropping again our survey. So your feedback is super appreciative to us. Um, you know, it really does help us create more programs like happy hour, honest hour, and more, um, and that we can provide at no cost to our awesome community. Um, so if you could just take a few minutes, fill that survey out, um, it's super, super helpful for us. Uh, upcoming, so launching into September, it is um, Suicide Prevention Awareness Month. So we do have quite a number of events that we are putting together just to kind of highlight that as well. Um, September 14th, we do have happy hour. September 22nd, we'll have our honest hour. We'll be debunk debunking the myths and facts surrounding um, substance use and um, suicide prevention. And then on September 28th, we'll have our last happy hour. As we get closer, we'll be announcing um, the Eventbrite pages um, where you can sign up at no cost, as well as um, all the fun activities we'll be doing. So we hope to see you at one of our future ones. But thank you everyone for joining us. And thank you, thank you, Mike, for joining us tonight and to have this awesome discussion about Harry Potter and mental health. Thank you so much for having me and for putting this all together. This was great. Uh, thanks to everyone in the chat who was was there and contributing lots of really great points. Um, and also to all the people who sang that Pottery List has gotten them, gotten them through some tough times. That's that's really nice. I certainly listen to podcasts and music, like you were saying with the playlists, if, if I'm feeling stressed out. So to know that stuff I create can help people warms my heart. But yeah, this was a very fun discussion. Thank you, Amanda, and the the entire NAMI team for, for helping out, and Jerrica, and, and everyone just making this a, a really fun time. I had a great time, and I hope everybody else did. Awesome. Well, thank you guys so much for joining us. We hope to see you next time. Um, have a fantastic, fantastic evening, and we'll see you soon. Yeah, have a good one. All right. Bye, everyone.